Welcome. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Laurel C. Schneider, Professor of Religious Studies at Vanderbilt University. At Vanderbilt University, Professor Schneider is appointed to the Religious Studies Department. In addition to the Religious Studies Department, she's also, she also holds affiliate status in the Women and Gender Studies Program, as well as the American Studies Program. Professor Schneider has taught at Vanderbilt since 2013. Prior to her time at Vanderbilt, she was a professor at Chicago Theological Seminary. A leading contemporary and constructive theologian, Dr. Schneider is a gifted scholar who is widely published. Her research interests span theological questions that challenge the totalizing production of isolating, uh, isolated and singular images of God. Hers is a leading voice that produces scholarship that sits at the intersection of theology, social justice, postmodernity, multiplicity, and polydoxy. Through constructive critical analysis, Schneider challenges traditional approaches to the study and articulations of the divine. She has uh, two sole authored books, Beyond Monotheism, A Theology of Multiplicity, and Reimagining the Divine, Confronting the Backlash Against Feminist Theology. She has two edited works, Polydoxy, Theology of Multiplicity and Relation, which she wrote, which she edited with Catherine Keller, and Awake to the Moment, Introducing Constructive Theology, which is co-written with the work group in Constructive Theology and co-edited with Dr. Stephen G. Ray. Please be on the lookout for her latest work, which will be coming out in the next few months, Queer Soul and Queer Theology, Ethics and Redemption in Real Life. This work is a part of Rutledge Press's New Critical Thinking in Religion, Theology, and Biblical Studies, and is co-authored with Dalathia Young. Professor, Professor Schneider is an outstanding advocate and an outstanding scholar. We are really fortunate to have the opportunity to hear her insights today. We're thankful for her contributions and her words yesterday. And now the next voice you'll hear is that of the professor, Laurel C. Schneider. Welcome back. Again, let me thank President Pittman and the Phillips community for the invitation to be with you today. I'm honored to do so along with two theologians I admire so much, Professor Tinker and Dean Butler. In this year that marks the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa massacre, and in a time right now that challenges all of our skills and wits to civility, I hope that we are able to contribute to a world that we have not yet seen in this land since the first slaving ships put down anchor off of these coasts and Columbus's descendants swept over the land. We have become the story of colonization, capitalist desacralization, and expansion. Let us work together on a better story to become for the sake of all the peoples of the world. I have entitled today's talk, Finding Grace Beyond Denial, Learning to Laugh Like Langston Hughes. I begin with the assumption, one that grounds my thinking, that white supremacy is a disease that has distorted our imaginations for so long that it has become a part of the structure of Christian thinking. I am convicted and persuaded on this point by the vast literature of black religious thought, most recently articulated in Willie James Jennings' book, The Christian Imagination. I am also convicted and persuaded by the literature of Native American scholars and theologians like Tink Tinker and Vine Deloria and philosophers like Donald Fixico, Thomas Norton Smith, and others that shape that, that the very shape of Christian thinking is parochially European, by which I mean that Christian thinking has itself been colonized for over a millennium by Northern European cultural frameworks, such that those parochial norms and rules of reasoning are themselves mistaken as objective standards for determining truth and for validating doctrine. The, I, the, the history of Christian theology, and I know this because I am trained as a theologian and I teach theology, is the history of German and English philosophical norms, except when we challenge it. <laughs> 
Finally, by way of introduction, I plan in this lecture to get a bit theoretical, to take up the challenge of thinking about Christian denials of culpability through the lens of humor, something I've learned at the feet of Indian teachers and scholars. Not because humor is a form of denial, but because it can so skillfully, instead, unmask it. As a Christian theologian, I believe, I truly believe, that Christian spirituality, the path of following Jesus, and the possibilities for our faith in a future that stops lying about the past, is the way my own faith journey as a white person must go. And as Emma Goldman said, if I can't dance, I don't want to be a part of your revolution. And I add, if I can't laugh, I don't want to be a part of your religion. Let me begin this journey with the story of Jesus' birth. Three of the four Christian Gospels begin their narratives of the life, teachings, and deeds of Jesus Christ with pregnancy and birth. It's an evocative story, a poor, unwed mother forced into a long and difficult journey by colonial powers, no place to rest, the birth of her fabled son attended by sheep, stars, and foreigners. Of course, it is much more than a story of one child's birth, more even than the story of a god's birth. It is the story of origin for a whole religion. Throughout the centuries, the narrative account of Mary's pregnancy, journey, and the night her son was born has been beloved for its intimacy, its theatrical quality, its familiarity, and its metaphoric power to dramatize the divine inauguration of Christianity. The birth narratives, or more specifically the pregnancy narratives, served primarily as fodder for the early theological arguments about incarnation, the divine, and human nature of the Christ. The sexual status of his mother in a cultural context of patrilineality became a narrative platform upon which late Hellenic ideas of divine stasis and purity could plausibly be integrated with late Hellenic ideas of mortal fragility and corruption in the fully divine, fully human form of Jesus Christ. The unnatural alliance between God and human being, first in Mary, then in her son Jesus, became a divine act of inauguration to which all Christians could point when Christianity's own legitimacy came into question. The fact that biblical scholars now understand the pregnancy and birth narratives to be questionable history is beside the point. The story made and makes history in its effects. And, as we've already heard in my earlier lecture, as Cherokee writer Thomas King reminds us, quote, the truth about stories is that's all we are. Of the many possibilities that the Christian pregnancy and birth narratives hold, uh, hold for us, I will focus here on the small detail of the baby Jesus crib. Not the feed box itself in which the infant is said to have first lain, but in some wordplay, the complex English etymology of the word crib, which gives us an opening to a more mature appreciation of Christian beginnings. So this is a playful approach here. I approach the crib and its rich variety of meanings indirectly through the lens of a poem entitled Crib by the U.S. Poet Laureate K. Ryan. In conversation with a philosophical sense of sensibility that I get from those Gerald Visner calls the storiers of natural reason on this continent, referring to Indian people. But first, let me clarify again some assumptions that I make about theology itself. A little bit of this is repetition, but I think it bears repeating. Theology is a second-order mode, mode of reasoning that relies on cultural and historical conventions of intelligibility and plausibility in its attempts to understand first-order experiences, stories, images, and practices. Theological reflection, rooted in the human desire to stretch intellect toward the farthest reaches and most intimate recesses of existence, is an important part of spiritual experience and religion, but it is not the whole of them. Theology, we can say, is a map, not the land itself. It takes up the linguistic and conceptual tools that establish plausibility within the specific cultural frameworks in which it functions. Theology seeks to trace or simulate a moving actuality of spirit that always exceeds its grasp. 
But theology presupposes the possibility, at least, of some coherence between spiritual experience and intellectual reasoning, and even some lively mutual influence, wherein faith can seek understanding rather than avoid understanding in the name of mystery or utterly defer to understanding in the name of rationality. This means that as a form of thinking, theology walks a fuzzy line between mystification and demystification, never able to reduce religious experience or God to the strictures of rationality, and yet never able to leave mystery bereft of reason. How theology walks between comprehension and mystery depends a great deal on the tools that we use. During the centuries of European domination of Christian thought and of Christian domination of European thought, it is not surprising that the codes of rationality forged in that cultural context also serve to shape the particular scope and criteria of plausibility in Christian theological inquiry. But the past few centuries of global shifts in populations and colonial overlapping and overtaking of cultures that resulted in massive political, economic, religious, and intellectual realignments, not to mention the conquering of bodies and destroying of lives, makes clear to many of us today that no theological approach stands alone. Indeed, no mode of cultural reasoning functions in a vacuum. This means any theology that relies only on modes of reasoning forged in the Euro-Christian cultural context has a limited capacity for understanding the deeper plurality of the world, indeed the deeper plurality of Christian thought itself. What counts as plausible in that particular context filters out much that counts for plausibility in other contexts. The sheer power and dominance of European modes of reasoning are no longer sufficient arguments in a truly complex world for avoiding or disregarding modes of reasoning that follow different criteria and other trajectories. It was never sufficient because Christianity was never entirely European. Many ancient cultural traditions with their varying modes of reasoning and varying sources of authority are already embedded within Christianity, as you well know. The Bible alone contains texts that originated in different cultures, exposing a range of rationalities that are expressed in a variety of genres. But even more important for theology's work today is the complicated multitude of cultures within which Christianity took and takes root and out of which it has developed over the past several millennia. As Thomas Reynolds neatly points out, quote, being religious, being Christian, already entails being beyond one's own local faith perspective. It already entails being interreligious, end quote. Theology that has grown over the course of millennia cannot help but result, in hindsight, in a kind of, quote, polyphonic bricolage, to lift a phrase from Caribbean studies. This assumption of original pluralism from which Christian theology properly begins, along with the mature awareness of the limitations of Euro-Christian modes of reasoning, form the primary set of presuppositions upon which my work depends. I have argued elsewhere that Christian theology generally suffers from a sensible lack, an anorexic denial even, of humor and of poetry, a wasting of understanding that results from over-reliance on apodictic and deductive modes of reasoning to the exclusion of other pathways. In order to think about the enhanced reasoning that poetics and humor offer to theology, I turn here to poetry, to one poem in particular, in which the trope of theft functions ironically to evoke a depth of complexity and plurality at the narrative birth of Christianity. This poem by Kay Ryan takes its strength partly from its play within the linguistic and theological traditions of Europe and America. In order to further complicate and understand the wonderful trickery and humor of Ryan's poem, I bring in a native North American philosophical pathway that Gerald Visner calls native modernity. And there's a whole bunch to say about what he means by, by that term, and I'm happy to talk about that if anybody wants to. 
It has, which, but that, that mode has always reasoned through the intersections of philosophy, poetry, and humor. In other words, I approach my topic today, the origin myth of Christianity, a little bit aslant, cribbing from, that, from literary criticism and Native American philosophies to illuminate its inherent multiplicity, which orthodoxy tends to repress. My decision to work here with a philosophical mode that comes from cultures not entirely my own does not come lightly. I do so accepting the challenge to white scholars that has been voiced by scholars such as Elizabeth Cook Lynn, James Cone, and Gerald Visner, who have all argued that the modes of reasoning as well as the narrative philosophical and theological resources originating outside of Europe have something to say to the problems and issues that affect all of us. Cohn consistently challenged white scholars to resist an obsessive turning to European sources for theological reflection. Andrea Smith has argued, in agreement with Ray Chow, that, eth quote, ethnic studies often confine themselves and are confined to the realm of ethnic or cultural representation, rather than positioning themselves as intellectual projects that can shape scholarly discourse as a whole and goes on to recommend positioning native peoples as producers of theory and not simply as objects of analysis." End quote. I take from, these cha from challenges such as these the theoretical possibility that anyone with good sense can reflect on and engage what I'm calling the mode of reasoning that has operated in many non-European traditions to reflect on materials and resources that may intersect with those, culturally's, those cultures tangentially, if at all. Furthermore, they can do so with reference to the motifs, figures, and contents of those cultures without necessarily misappropriating them en route. There is, of course, risk either way. Misappropriation is a real possibility on the one hand, as I spoke about yesterday, especially as modes of reasoning usually depend upon specific cultural contents, even by those of goodwill. But the avoidance of this risk through a careful observance of ethnic hermeneutical boundaries can repetitively return to a reiteration of, of exclusively European cultural modes of reasoning. If, as a white thinker, I only refer to European sources, my thinking will remain constrained and repetitive of those modes. It's not clear that I will learn anything. I am persuaded by the argument of black and native scholars that their works and methods, quote, must be part of this conversation because the logics of settler colonialism structure all of society, not just those who are black or indigenous. Christian theology has an opportunity to become more honest about the complexity of its own stories and more cognizant of the fertile impurity of its origins. Integrating the fruits of other modes of reasoning is not a new phenomenon in theology. African modes of reasoning, for example, first gave Christianity the Trinity. What is new and still all too rare is acknowledgement of the sources of those fruits. There has been a great deal of thievery in the creation of the, of the Christian world. Denying it exacerbates its destructive if, if effects. Naming it and telling stories about it does not remove the reality of Christian larceny, both petty and grand. But the stories, told carefully and with the insights of a more poetic and humorous mode of reasoning, may surface the ambiguity out of which life comes, the messiness that makes birth possible, the truth that may set us more free. So, here is the poem by Kay Ryan, a white woman, a lesbian, a former U.S. Poet Laureate, entitled Crib. Crib, from the Greek for woven or plaited, which quickly translated to basket, whence the verb crib, which meant to filch, under cover of wicker anything, some liquor, a cutlet. For we want to make off with things that are not our own. There is a pleasure theft brings, a vitality to the home. Cribbed objects or answers keep their guilty shimmer forever. Have you noticed? Yet religions downplay this. Note, for instance, in our annual rehearsals of innocence, the substitution of manger for crib, as if we ever deserved that baby or thought we did. In this wonderful poem, 
Ryan reflects on the etymology of crib, a term that swings readily between naughty and nice, landing guilt right into the middle of innocence. It is a wonderful word, ancient enough to have accrued meanings that clash and thereby to have enhanced its complexity and nuance. Go to the Oxford English Dictionary and crib is a feeding structure out in fields, a dwelling place of thieves, a cradle, a cheat sheet, a brothel, covered basket, saloon, and an illegitimate translation. I love that. What is more, in usage, quote, nearly all early quotations of crib applied to the manger in which the infant Christ was laid. So, in the first few lines here, Ryan imagines the origins of the word literally as a covering for what might be stolen. She says, to filch, under cover of wicker, anything, some liquor, a cutlet. The heart of the poem, however, is much more than etymology. It's a reflection on the guilty pleasures of theft, a, quote, vitality to the home that perhaps can only come from things that do not belong to us. She's talking about small-time theft, at least at the start, but through the humorous wink and nudge over satisfied pleasures that come from harmless scams, she entraps us with complicity and the complexity of pleasure in bigger, world-altering crimes. Ryan teases out the ambiguity of cribbing, especially in terms of its theological and religious implications. She ends the poem with a pseudo-lament that religions disavow the animating character of theft even as they depend upon it. She accuses Christianity, although not in so many plodding words, of overplaying its own innocence by in effect switching the crib for manger. She says, note, for instance, in our annual rehearsals of innocence, the substitution of manger for crib, as if we ever deserved that baby or thought we did. So what is important here, both for the humor of the poem and the theological insight to which the humor points, is that Ryan is not discrediting the crib or the counterfeit that it implies, not even in terms of Jesus himself. Instead, she indicts religion's pretensions to legitimacy, its cover-ups of its own invariably inglorious and promiscuous beginnings. She dismisses typical Christian avowals of innocence that pretend the founding stories of Christian faith are not a pastiche of pickpocketed baubles and filched treasures. Apart from the saucy impiety of such a claim, Ryan seems to be suggesting that Christianity's protestations of innocence actually diminish us, and so presumably dim the enlivening radiance of the treasure swaddled at its core. In contrast to orthodox Christian thought, the idea that imposture and thievery is part and parcel of the vitality of the divine spirit has long functioned at the root of trickster theologies in native modernity and continues to function in some native Christianities. Trickster, coyote, hare, spider, brer rabbit, and others, depending on the language and tradition, is often a critical figure in native North American and African indigenous creation accounts. His or her greedy heists, disastrous but funny scams, and irreversible mistakes are actually necessary to the creation of the complex world in which people, the, which the people inhabit and which they become. Ryan's crib also suggests a heist at the center of Christianity's story of origin that parsed through the reasoning mode of Visner's native modernity may reveal far more than a joke. Or rather, the joke reveals far more than could be expressed without it. The joke, in this case, a cribbed god, reveals a fertile ambiguity at the heart of Christianity that endures and may even require its originary subterfuge, but that, rather than compounding the error by denying it, maintains a proper perspective on its ambiguity by laughing at it. In the Native American cultures out of which the trickster traditions come, he or she is a master of words, of parody, lies, cons, and stories that we could say in a Wittgensteinian sense should result in a totality of language, a summation of reality as narrative alone. This may well be true if there is in fact no porous relation between language and the possibility of worlds that exist beyond the tissue of grammar. But for those who are open to more, as theologians must be, 
There is more here to pursue. The scams that the trickster pulls, the cons that he or she unselfconsciously and often without malice masterminds, do actually create the world that human and other animals inhabit. Animals lose or gain speech, appendages, skills, and any number of relations due to tricksters' greedy mistakes. Mountains fold into slumbering ancestors and trees become rivers. Even stones cry out in response to his or her indecent creativity. It's not necessary to assume a narrow positivism here to glimpse real possibilities inherent in these accounts. Although I share Grindy's op observation that, quote, when Jesus Christ walks on water, this is treated as religious, but when Coyote steals fire, it is invariably characterized by the dominant society's discourse as legend, or worse yet, folklore. Whether the trickster elements in Native North American traditions are treated linguistically and metaphorically, or philosophically, they offer by way of example an alternative to the narrow exclusions that Western philosophical rationalism has imposed on the actual trickiness and complexity of Christian texts and traditions. The cribs of trickster narratives illuminate a deeper logic in Native North American ontological appraisals of the way things are and ought to be. That logic resides in the vatic quality of humor that any serious accounting of reality requires. In other words, the storiers of native modernity pursue through ironic and parabolic lenses a, quote, common tease of cultures, a sense of presence, and the obscure traces of traditions, end quote, that otherwise utterly evade the grinding reasoning of European modernity. This natural reason allows for honesty about theft even long after the fact and recognizes its effects in the world that is created for better or worse as a result. Humor here, in other words, is not without horror. And it is more than a mere coping strategy. It's an element of a mode of reasoning that recognizes long-term consequences in actions, words, and concepts, even when those consequences can only be sketched in caricature and put metaphorically into stories of possibility. Some things are so serious, Langston Hughes said, that only humor can touch them. Let me say that again. Some things are so serious, Langston Hughes said, that only humor can touch them. Friedrich Nietzsche, who was an acerbic critic of European modernity as well as one of its devoted sons, had an intuition of this when he entertained the possibility that, quote, some truths are singularly shy and ticklish and cannot be caught by the plodding modes of Hegelian reasoning, which he, does, which he so despised. He asked, quote, does a matter necessarily remain ununderstood and unfathomed merely because it has been touched on only in flight, glanced at in a flash? End quote. At times, capable himself of great insight through laughter, Nietzsche understood fleet-footed humor to be able to travel through a land that the heavily treaded brush-clearing machinery of humorless Western logic simply flattens and so mistake or miss or destroy altogether. I choose the metaphor of land deliberately here, as native modernity also never forgets the realities of Western expansion, not only in cultural terms, but in terms of the land on which we all theologians in the Americas stand. Settler colonialism is a mode of reasoning, but it is also a material reality. Theft undergirds the economic structures, think slavery and land, and the physical spaces, think real estate and homes, of Euro-American modernity that is also a globalized colonial modernity. But in this context, that in, in a context that should perhaps kill humor altogether, native modernity uses humor like a sharpened blade to chart alternative courses through the thickets of existence and thereby not only sees the theological land differently, but can actually produce different concepts and different knowledges in relation to it. 
It's also true and important to point out that post-colonial humor in particular also serves as, quote, a strategy for exposing how Western epistemologies and scientific, aesthetic, and historiographic discourses may inherently condition one-dimensionally European responses and interpretations. Humor is rel end quote. <laughs> Humor is revelatory and strategic for communities that under colonial assault were not or are not meant to survive, as Audre Lorde said. In 1969, Lakota theologian Vine Deloria Jr. wrote in his book, Custer Died for Your Sins, that, quote, when a people can laugh at themselves and laugh at others and hold all aspects of life together without letting anybody drive them to extremes, then it seems to me that people can survive. End quote. What is more, Laguna poet Paulet Gunn Allen declares, quote, We live in a time that has much that is shabby and tricky to offer, and much that needs to be treated with laughter and ironic humor. End quote. Postcolonial and decolonial humor relies on ambiguity, discrepancy, and incongruity and in so doing employs a kind of perception that tilts what is taken for granted and allows for a reconsideration of sacred or merely habituated categories. But along with Visner, I suggest that what is strategic and canny in the face of overwhelming and unremitting assault is also ont ontically significant. It is productive of knowledge and wisdom and a, and a restorer of bodies in the face of deeper questions of orientation to tradition and world. It addresses the question, how is the coming generation to live? Humor that bears ontic significance is also, as I've indicated already, profoundly serious. Perhaps because it often travels the sharp edges of hurt and uncertainty, such humor may be, as Langston Hughes has suggested, what you wish in your heart were not funny, but it is and you must laugh. I mean, what is funny about a poor, young, unwed woman traveling at night, nine months pregnant, depending on the goodwill of a man willing to engage in the, sub in the subterfuge of fatherhood? Where is the humor in her labor out in a field or the demanding cries of her baby? Nothing is really humorous in the content of the story itself. Well, except maybe for the Annunciation, the shepherds, the angels, the sheep, and the wise men. The humor of the crib, however, itself is also its horror both of which are only available in hindsight in the hindsight of imperial Christianity's boastful claims to legitimacy. And perhaps only those who understand the pain of having been that poor, lost young woman, bearing the burden of divine and imperial schemes, perhaps only they really can laugh. There is certainly irony in the triumphal arches, solemn processions, and avowals of holy innocence in the midst of genocidal advances and purges, in the beauty of golden and marble paetas and creches, in doctrines of love and compassion and expansion and conversion of blankets and food and guns, all nestled together in the innocence of a cribbed God. We could see that as a kind of funny, in a particular horrifying kind of way. It is funny because it's part of what constitutes the world. Its story has helped to create the crazy, ambiguous, painful, and lively world in which we now live. Erasing the, the crib as theft erases Christianity, erases us all. You wish with all of your heart that it was not funny, but from the angle of ontic significance, as Langston Hughes says, it is, and you must laugh. And so, to return to Kay Ryan's poem, at work here is an insight framed as a punning joke about Christian or any other self-important religious claim to authority and ownership. It has the same sort of potential for exposing the obvious that the proverbial little boy has in the fable of the emperor's new clothes. In spite of the regal processions and elaborate rehearsals of possession, Jesus doesn't belong to Christianity. He never did. He is one of those cribbed objects or answers quote, that thereby retains a hold on us and a power, a vitality, a shimmer that we cannot really explain. Our attempts to own him move into denial, cover up, settler colonialism, Christian nationalism. 
So in addition to all of its other meanings, crib also means to steal. In Eric Bentley's discussion of the prevalence of theft in the plots of good comic dramas, he says, if we did not wish to break the tenth, tenth Commandment, comic plotting as we know it would never have come into being. He reminds us that, quote, to steal is to falsify, for it is to forge, as it were, a title to ownership. Theft is an idea which, applied to the collection of stories upon which Christian theology depends, undermines any claim we might have to the purity of theology's content, by which I mean the theologian's ability to stake claims of ownership to the objects or answers that have already been cribbed in its sources. Similarly, stories themselves have a volatile, creative power that doctrinal absolutism can entirely miss, or may seek to miss, glossing their volatility as the dispensable byproduct of human frailty. So rather than adding clarity and wisdom to the core stories, or even extracting wisdom from them, theology that cleaves too tightly to axiomatic norms of judgment, that eschews humor and takes itself and its presumed possessions too seriously, ends up desiccating and distorting the potential for wisdom that is resident in those stories, and cancels the invitational openness and spirit that they do possess. Of course, and here is the tricky bit for me as a white theologian taking all of this utterly seriously. Theft or forgery may be the basis of comedy, but by that very token, it is also the basis of tragedy. The brutal thefts of lands, of human bodies and lives, of languages and of freedoms that have built the structures of privilege upon which the industrialized capitalist world gorges itself. Theft is not a virtue, either in native traditions or in contemporary theology, and it should not be romanticized, as it is never romanticized in post-colonial humor. As Kenneth Lincoln writes, quote, there is always hurt in humor and vice versa. It's the way one learns the truth. In addition, in his essay on comedy, the uh, playwright Christopher Fry insists that, quote, there is an angle of experience where the dark is distilled into light, where our tragic fate finds itself with perfect pitch and goes straight to the key which creation was composed in, end quote. The tragic, in other words, cannot be glossed or smoothed away with a laugh nor can the weight of responsibility lift from the shoulders of the thieves of light distilled from darkness. Let me say that again, especially to all of my white brothers and sisters. Nor can the weight of responsibility lift from the shoulders of the thieves of light. But neither should the role of theft and deception in the creative motion of the world be denied. The theft of life by predators and their constant frustration by prey contributes to the audacious genius of evolution, just as every stolen life remains irreplaceable and utterly grievable, a spur to transformation and to the creative impasse of never again. And so theft and deception are not benign ideas in a world reeling from rapacious centuries of colonial devastation. They do not offer themselves as themes for theological reflection, except as challenges to the ownership and provenance of theological doctrines in general, and to the introduction of new and long overdue humility and levity via the sagacious, sagacious application of a philosophical sense of humor. Paul understood this, St. Paul understood this in his discussion of grace. Did the promise of grace mean that we should sin the more that grace may abound? No. Should we steal the more that humor may abound? Laugh as if there is no pain? Laugh to cover up pain? No. What I'm suggesting is that the long practice of denying the crib has done Christian theology no favors, nor has it protect protected anyone from ecclesial deceit. In fact, it's possible that the denial of its originary thefts has allowed the mild joke of Christianity's equation with good behavior, right? That's kind of funny, you know, the Christian equation that to be Christian is, means you have to behave, but allowed that to harden into punitive and humorless laws about decency and purity, into racist formulations and justifications of genocide. I'm suggesting that it is the humor in Ryan's poem that works subtly and yet powerfully to unmask the trope of larceny cradled at the narrative heart of our Christian self-avowals of innocence. 
crib suggests something inherently contrary and funny in the entire edifice of Christian pomp and self-satisfaction, especially in our Christmas invocations of the Bethlehem narrative, but it doesn't stop there. In a manner resonant with native modernity, Ryan reveals non-innocence in the innocent. She peeks under the baby blanket of Christian immaculation and sees a purloined letter happily slumbering there. But her disruption of the crib's monosemic simplicity is more than fi functional. Beyond a tool of unmasking, her humor is a mode of theological construction that starts from the virtue and fertility of non-innocence. By its very complicity and plurality, the newborn Jesus as crib is what makes theology capable of birth, which is messy. I see in it a possibility for white participants in this contemporary challenging time, we who are committed to working against the horrors that beset and continue to plague our brothers and sisters and that deform us, to take up the crushing weight of our inheritance without the immobilization that comes from useless self-flagellation or the passivity that comes from guilty silence. Our non-innocence is deadly serious. We must change our dominating ways or die. We can begin by allowing ourselves to stop lying about the innocence and purity of our most sacred stories. We can learn to laugh at ourselves as part of the pedagogy of becoming useful to our brothers and sisters. The newborn Christ is a crib sheet of the enduring multiplicity threaded throughout the fabric of Christian identity. His story, his stories, paced together a mosaic of Jewish lore, localized healing cults, Greek oracular traditions, Hellenistic philosophy, Roman victory cults, pilgrimage and hero narratives, and on and on. As the ontic signi signifier, the crib's ambiguity and incongruity as a cradle and a cheat sheet make it humorous but also give to theology an open-ended capacity that pedantic and self-righteous solemnity foregoes. Perhaps the crib can provide to theology what some have called the force of life and thereby restore or introduce to Christian theology a recognition that incarnation has to be messy and ambiguous if it is to have anything to do with actual embodiment. Perhaps a better, more contrary and humorous story of the crib can give to Christian theology a hope of actually recognizing incarnation when it bawls and clamors for the breast. If the crib at the heart of Christianity offers anything to a long overdue mode of theological reasoning that involves humor, it is the suggestion of a distinctive and thoroughly grounded mode of Christian thought that need not lie about its origins and its illegitimacy any more than it ever has needed to exclude fugitive newborns or, the, or life stories that are told four ways where several of the gospel variations literally place Jesus in a crib in their opening scenes, theology has cribbed its answers from the riches of local wisdom, stories of power, inherited traditions, aphorisms, scientific findings, cultural norms, political expedience, popular culture, visual art, philosophical disciplines, war traumas, heroic narratives, middle passages, and anything else that helped to maneuver the bits and pieces of the ancient stories and exhortations into an architecture of meaning for whole communities frontally faced with the challenges of existence. Such cribbing might be described as nomadic experimentation, or it might be described in economic terms such as hunting and gathering. I suggest, how, however, that theft pushes us further toward honesty than the nomad or the hunter-gatherer, though I'm not arguing against those either, or any others. But theft may resist or help us to resist a too easy return to impostures of legitimacy. Next to imperial greed, the hubris of legitimacy is one of the oldest and strongest obstacles to integrity in Christian theology. And for that reason alone, it bears watching. But beyond that concern, and this is a thought experiment, 
It is only one way that we might think together about Christian tendencies to, de to deny the roles that our theologies have played in settler colonialism, in slavery, in the theft of bodies and lives that have so shaped what we are experiencing today, in our avoidances of what is happening on our streets at this moment, in our avoidances of what has happened to our black brothers and sisters, and so many more. What I hope to learn what I hope to learn from the poets and stories is the storytellers' contrary and humor-sharpened suspicion that a certain amount of pilfering and counterfeit is necessary to creation itself and should not be glossed over or made legitimate. Maybe we can better attend to the stories that we all are, especially when they are told truthfully and carefully and in the right season. Thank you.